this is Chaplain Greg Johnston, and uh, thank you for watching the second video. This is uh, very, very cool that we're able to connect together, and uh, welcome again to The Wandering Wesleyan. If you missed my first video, my first video I talked about why I call this The Wandering Wesleyan, and uh, I encourage you to go check that out. I also ask that you please like and subscribe to my channel, like this video, subscribe to my channel, and set the post notification bell, and every week when I post a video, you'll be notified. So, I promised that I would talk about my theological distinctives and what I'm going to be bringing to our discussions. Well, there's a, there, I, I've had a lot of influences in my life, theologically, and reading the Bible, and of course, it all begins with this book, the Bible. Here I have a New Living Translation. And uh, my Reformed friends just went out of their minds for me holding a New Living Translation. But it's a wonderful translation. Um, it's a great translation to read. So it's not the main one that I use. The main one that I use is the Christian Standard Bible. And when we get into Bible translations in our first series called Walking in the Word, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, there are a number of very, very good uh, channels on YouTube that talk about different Bible translations, and I'll refer to those as, as we go on. But uh, it, as I mentioned in my first video, I was not raised a, uh, I was not raised a Christian. My family did not go to church. So a lot of my theology I've really had to discover on my own um, because I didn't have, I didn't grow up with the theology. A lot of my friends who were Christians since they were, you know, a child and their families are Christian grew up in a certain theological perspective and I, I didn't have that and I feel kind of blessed for that in a lot of ways because God has uh, made me open to a lot of different perspectives. Um, the Catholic perspective obviously was very influential in my early adulthood. Um, and then uh, the Reformed Calvinist position was also important uh, in, later in my early adulthood, in my, in my 30s. And, and uh, so where am I at now? Where, where have I come? Well, I'm, I've come for, full circle from um, my best friend's dad's church, which was a Methodist church. He was a Methodist pastor. And um, I got to tell you, one of the most significant people to influence me is Mr. John Wesley. And here I hold his sermons collected by Collins and Vickers. This is a fantastic collection. And uh, if you're looking for some devotional reading over the course of uh, 2024, or if you're watching this later on than that, and you want to get some devotional reading, the sermons of John Wesley collected by uh, Collins and Vickers, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, so John Wesley had, has had a profound effect on how I view scripture. And uh, who was this guy, Wesley? Well, Wesley started out as a failure. He, uh, he, he was raised in a Christian home, and he and his brother decided to sail from uh, England to the penal colony in Georgia in order to convert the Indians. That was a complete disaster. And one of the reasons why was that uh, he was, um, he didn't take his faith seriously. He was all about the rules and the regulations of his faith. But he didn't take a relationship with Jesus seriously. And as he was traveling, he met a group of people called the Moravians who did take their faith seriously. And when he got back to England after this disaster of a trip to Georgia, he encountered Jesus. And he had a life-changing, what he called a heartwarming experience of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And uh, he went on and uh, was uh, a part of a group called the Methodists. And uh, this was a group of people that were very serious about their faith. And uh, George Whitfield 
was a member of this group, uh, a famous field preacher, and invited Wesley one day to preach in the fields. And Wesley thought, no, I, I can't do that. That's not something that preachers, and, and he was an Anglican priest, so that's not what they do. Um, but he did it. And it was a, an amazing experience with thousands of people coming to a faith in Jesus because of that. So he wrote a lot of sermons. As you can tell, this is not a small book. Um, he wrote a lot of sermons. And uh, so he garnered what's called the Wesleyan perspective. And really, it, it centers around four central things. The first thing is that God's grace extends to everybody. And this is what differentiates Wesleyan thinking from your more Reformed thinking, where Reformed thinking believes in limited atonement, that, that God did not die for everybody. Wesleyans believe God died for everybody. Uh, Jesus gave his life for all of humanity. Um, it comes by what they call pre prevenient grace, enabling us to respond to the good news of salvation. It doesn't mean that everybody does respond, but every person on the face of the planet has the ability to respond to the gospel. Salvation is God's justifying grace, and anybody can receive it who wants it. Uh, following salvation, God empowers us with sanctifying grace. We're filled with God's holy love, with his Holy Spirit, and we develop Christian character. This is open to anyone who wants it. It's not closed. And we experience God's glorifying grace when we are resurrected and fully conformed to the image of Christ. So we believe that resurrection is a part of this life that, that any person on the face of the earth who has lived, is living, will live, can have this opportunity. Now, the second distinctive is something that Wesley called the means of grace. What is the means of grace? We believe in sacraments. I believe in the sacrament of baptism and communion. Um, I don't believe baptism like Wesley. Wesley didn't believe that baptism nor communion saved somebody. But it's a response to our relationship. Um, when we become followers of Jesus, we receive we can re receive baptism, and that is a testimony. It is a public testimony of an inward faith. Communion also is an ongoing sacrament, something that we do with frequent frequency. Uh, in my mind, it should be as as frequent as possible, um, but it is a celebration of the Lord's death and resurrection and the new covenant using the Passover elements of bread and wine. So means of grace is also things such as scripture reading, praying, good works, uh, fasting, all kinds of things. And these don't gain somebody their salvation, but it develops character. It develops Christian character. It develops a relationship with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. The third distinctive that Wesleyans have is community. We believe that Christianity is meant to be expressed in community. It's not a lone wolf situation. For the person that thinks, well, I don't need to be a church-going person in order to be a Christian, eh, Wesleyans would disagree with that. In order to be a Christian, an active Christian, a growing Christian, you need fellowship. You need other Christians around you. So community is important. And the last distinctive is called personal and social holiness. And this is a list that I'm reading from my church's website that uh, my pastor and I put together. And personal and social holiness tends to be kind of the, uh, the part that causes a little controversy because here's where 
you hear the term Christian perfection. Christian perfection. <clears throat> Christian perfection, from a Wesleyan perspective, hear me clearly now, is not that you follow all the rules perfectly all the time. No. It doesn't mean that you never sin. Christian perfection is that place where you are loving God and loving your fellow human beings as perfectly as you can. So Wesley defined it as being clothed in the righteousness of Christ, but still bound by sin. And guess what? Here's the key. It's not done by our power but by the power of the Holy Spirit that resides in us. There's no such thing as sinless perfection. Not while we're in this body, not while we're here. But according to Wesleyan theology, we can grow in our relationship with Jesus to a point where we can love God and love our human beings as perfectly as we can. That's what it means. Drop some comments if you have some thoughts about that, because I'd like to hear from you on that. Let's go on to some other theological, theological distinctives that I have. Um, here's another book that is really influential for me, John Wimber's Power Evangelism. Um, I am not a cessationist by any means. I am a continuationist. What does that mean? I believe the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for today. I believe in healing. I believe in prophecy, tongues, the whole bit. Teaching. I believe in uh, the continuation of the apostolic movement. Church planters, ap apostles. Hmm. Um, prophecy. I, I just mentioned that. Um, all of that is still active today. John Wimber was, uh, was an amazing man, uh, former Quaker, who discovered Jesus uh, later in his life. And uh, as he was reading the Bible in his church, he went to his pastor and said, Pastor, when do we get to do this stuff? And his pastor said, what do you mean? He said, the stuff that Jesus did, like heal people. Like, uh, cast out demons. When do we get to do that? His pastor wasn't too thrilled about that. But John f went on and he founded a movement called the Vineyard Movement. And uh, that has been uh, very, very influential to me uh, through the years. Um, next book. Uh, this is a book that completely wrecked me when I read it. And I've read lots of this author since then, and that's N.T. Wright. And this is a book called The Day the Revolution Began. Um, I it, it just totally wrecked me when I read it. Uh, N.T. Wright is an Anglican bishop. He's no longer a bishop. He is uh, retired. As retired as he can be, he still writes. He still uh, lectures from time to time. But he is a uh, thinker and a theologian that I have grown very, very fond of and has profoundly influenced my way, especially of looking at eschatology, which is this, which is the theology of the end times. Um, and uh, looking at Paul, uh, people put him in this realm of NPP, or new perspective of Paul, and I, I don't think that's exactly fair. I think it's a, a good way for some people to put a label in and dismiss a person without really actually reading what they wrote and what they uh, are are teaching. So I don't believe, I, I, I don't agree with everything right or any of these folks uh, talk about, but that's why we have discussion. That's why we have interaction like this. Lastly, and I don't have a, uh, I, I don't have a, a physical copy of this book, but uh, a fellow by the name of Scott McKnight has also profoundly influenced me, and especially his book, Reading Romans Backwards, and another book that he wrote called The King Jesus Gospel. Those two books are just amazing. Uh, uh, Reading Romans Backwards 
turned, well, I mean, turn on its head how I used to read Romans. And I read it in a much different way now. I think a, a little bit more accurate way. And uh, the, the King Jesus Gospel talks about how we have limited the gospel to believe in Jesus so that when you die, you'll go to heaven. Um, I don't think that question is relevant anymore. Uh, Billy Graham used to ask this question in his crusades, and I think it was very relevant when he was preaching. Um, if you died today, would you go to heaven? And I think most people would say, uh, who weren't believers, um, I don't know. I think nowadays people say, I don't care. And that's a much different answer. And if our gospel is believe in Jesus so that when you die, you get to go to heaven... There's a lot in between believing in Jesus and dying and going to heaven. There's a lot of life in there. And I think that the gospel is much bigger than that. It's more profound than that. And that's what that book is all about. And you'll see that in my theology as we, as we, go, through, um, as we go through the next series, which I'm going to start next week in my next video. Um, and that is going to be the Walking in the Word series. Uh, we'll have an introduction uh, the first week or two, and then we'll get into Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and that'll take a few weeks and go on from there. So, again, this is your uh, chaplain, Greg Johnston, uh, The Wandering Westland. Thank you for tuning in. Again, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and set that post notification. Uh, so that each week when I post a video, video you can be uh, notified of it. Um, liking the video also helps with the logarithm so we can get this material out to more people. So thank you very much. God bless.